Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Long, long ago, back in the days when children went to school in person and ate lunch together in a crowded room known as a cafeteria, at the beginning of the school lunch line, there was a large pile of apples. And a clever lunch lady, in a desperate attempt to improve the moral standing of the students, had put a sign next to the apples, and that sign said, Take only one apple. God is watching you. Well, further down at the other end of the lunch line was a large pile of chocolate chip cookies. And next to this pile, a clever student had added his own note, and it said, Take all the cookies you want. God is watching the apples. Psalm 139 is a hymn to the inescapable God, the God who sees everything, knows everything, and brings everything out into the light. Now, if you're a take two apples kind of person or a take five cookies kind of person, that idea might be terrifying to you. But if you're the kid at the end of the lunch line who always arrives to find a plate full of empty cookie crumbs, Psalm 139 might be a little bit comforting. Actually, most people who read this psalm take great comfort from it. You may not know the name, Psalm 139, but I promise you, you've heard many of the words. This is one of the most popular and often quoted psalms right behind Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It is also some of the most beautiful and familiar poetry in the entire Bible. This psalm has inspired countless works of art, music, and literature. And just 10 days ago, I read these words, the words of this psalm, to the family of church member Mercy Goff as we paid our respects and laid her to rest beside her husband, Dean. Mercy Goff loved the Psalms, and this was one of her favorites. What is it about Psalm 139 that speaks so powerfully to so many people? Let's jump in and find out. The first section of the psalm, the first six verses, are about knowledge. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot attain it. In America today, we're pretty obsessed with privacy. Probably because we have less and less of it with every passing year and each new technology. Between Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon.com, someone, somewhere is keeping track of almost every aspect of your life. What you purchase, what you read, where you go, your political party, and even what you say in your most intimate conversations via email, text message, and anywhere when you are in the vicinity of your always-on, always-listening smartphone or smart home speaker. And yet, despite that fact that someone is always watching, always listening, despite the fact that these companies know so much about you, I think most of us today have a nagging sense that no one really knows us. No one really understands us. No one really gets us, at least not in the way that we long to be known and understood. You see, Amazon collects all of that information about you 
because they want to sell you more things, something that is in their best interest, not necessarily yours. But Psalm 139 teaches us that God searches out our paths and is acquainted with all of our ways. Why is it that God wants to know so much about us? There's nothing that we can offer to God that God doesn't already have. Why does God want to know us so intimately? The answer to that question comes later in the third section of this psalm. But first, let's listen to the second section, verses 7 through 12. If the first section was about God's knowledge, the second section is about God's presence. So verse 7 Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. Just a quick note, heaven in Hebrew is the word that refers to the skies, what's up there. And shale is the word that refers to the earth and what's down there. This is before connotations of an afterlife came into into the Jewish culture. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now, most of us were taught when we were children that God is everywhere. There is certainly truth to that. But Psalm 139 is a little bit more specific. It's not so much that God is everywhere all the time, but rather God is everywhere that we are. God goes everywhere that we go before us and behind us and all around us. Not in a creepy stalker kind of way, but more like an advanced team that goes in and prepares the way before someone really important gets to their destination, making sure it's safe for that person to be there. Or like a friend who refuses to leave your side. Or like that one person, and everyone has one, Like that one person that you always call when you're in trouble because you know that he or she will find you, will come for you, will tear down any obstacle in the way to get to where you are and to bring you back to safety. That's how God is. That's where God is. And now comes the why. Why would God do all of that? Why does God stick with us Why does God watch over us even when we are often horrible people, harmful to each other, harmful to ourselves, and harmful to the world around us? The answer is verses 13 through 18. For, or because, it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. If the first two sections of Psalm 139 were about God's knowledge and God's presence, the third section is about God's actions, God's works. And God's greatest feat, the greatest accomplishment of all in the eyes of God, is you. You are, in the words of Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made. 
by a God who knew every thought that you would ever think, every word that you would ever say to another person, and everything you would ever do in public or in secret long before you even came into existence. God knew all of that and still calls you his greatest accomplishment. Now, some of you are thinking right now that God must be either incredibly forgiving or incredibly stupid. I promise you, it's the first one. Yes, God does see all of our pettiness and weaknesses and our flaws. But we tend to dwell on those things, to brood on them. So often we get stuck in that place, creating our own miniature little hell and becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. I believe that God sees us differently. God chooses to see each and every one of us as the person we were created to be, who we are in our better and best moments, who we could have been had we made every right and good decision along the way, and who we still have the potential to become today, tomorrow, and the day after that. That's how God sees each one of us. The last section of Psalm 139, minus the final two verses, is the part that always gets left out. It's the part that is never quoted from. It is the part that never gets read at funerals. And that's because right before the end, the beautiful and soaring poetry of Psalm 139 takes an unexpected turn to the vindictive. Now, if you've read the Psalms much, this shouldn't surprise you at all, but it is a little bit jarring coming right after such an affirming message of God's universal knowledge, reach, and love. But for me, these problematic verses at the end, verses 19 through 22, are the most human part of the entire psalm. These later verses are the reminder that even the psalmist, even the poet himself, is like we are. Beautiful, 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 ugly, beautiful. And so verse 19, the psalmist says, Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. In these verses, the psalmist tries to couch his own vindictiveness towards his enemies in religious terms, in the name of God. That's something a lot of people have done throughout the centuries and in most religions. It's like saying, God, I only hate the people you hate. I'm only against the people who are against you. And yet when you dig deeper into that sentiment, usually what the person saying words like that means is, God, I want you to hate the people I hate. Since I'm your friend, God, all those people who are against me must be against you, right? Let's go get them. But then, in the final two verses of this psalm, the psalmist walks himself back, thankfully, from the brink and puts everything, including his own bitterness and vindictiveness, in God's hands again. Verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. People of First Presbyterian Church, may you always place yourselves, your passions, your pleasures, your fears, and your failures in God's capable hands. And may you always know 
that wherever you wander in this wide world, God is already there with you. From the highest heights to the deepest depths, you are known completely, and you are completely loved. Let us pray. Lord, what a gift we find in the Psalms, these beautiful words of comfort and assurance, poetic words that comfort us and challenge us at the same time. Help us to see ourselves the way the psalmist describes your sight of us. Lord, help us to see each other the way you see us with that kind of love and grace and forgiveness. And Lord, where we fail, just like the psalmist, where we turn to bitter or vindictive words or actions, lead us quickly back onto the path, the way everlasting, the way of love. Lord, we pray and ask all of these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.